I don't know what we can talk about in this nation without talking about white superiority, honestly. Who defines the meaning of God also defines the relationship between economy and God. African Americans spent $1.3 trillion last year, making us the 16th wealthiest nation in the world. Why have we not turned those riches into wealth to develop our community? We're going to come back to the Americas now and, and talk about a couple of different things. And, um, you know, one of the things that's, uh, uh, I guess, made mention of a lot, a lot of people talk about um, is the, the African relationship to the Seminole Native Americans. Please, can you please elaborate on this? Now you see, that's another face. So we talked about um, Lucia, the name of the skeletal remains from ancient Brazil. And we talked about Califia, this important figure in, um, in the mythology of the Americas. And then we talked a little bit about the African presence in Mesoamerican civilization. And then you have African people who probably came to the Americas much later. For example, Balboa, one of the Spanish conquistadors, identified a black community, which he called Ethiopian, in um, the Darien Peninsula of Panama in 1513. And then you have Africans who are captured and brought to the Americas against their will. And what is most important, I think, for us to emphasize is that there was constant resistance. They attacked the dungeons in Africa. They revolted on the ships and they revolted in the Americas. And the revolts took many different forms. It might take the form of running away. It might take the form of insurrection. But sometimes you also have what are called maroon communities or Cimarrones communities. That means a wild man, apparently a Spanish word. And we find a lot of evidence of this in Haiti, in Brazil, in Colombia, in Mexico and Jamaica. But you also find it to some extent in the Americas. And perhaps the most exalted phase of that is the Seminoles. The Seminoles uh, existed initially in Florida and they were a combined group of Africans and Native Americans. And they are important to us because they fought a sustained war of liberation against the US government for 150 years. One of the things about these Maroon communities, they raised so much hell they resisted so much that Europeans felt threatened by their mere existence. And so the Dutch, the Spanish, the Portuguese, the English, et cetera, put great pressure to bear on these sisters and brothers. And one of the things that would always be included in the treaties that were offered to them is that they would be given their freedom. But from now on, anyone, any African who escaped from slavery and went to them for refuge would have to be returned to the plantations of Hacienda. This split the Maroon communities. Around 1859, at the eve of the US Civil War, more than two thirds of the United States Army and Navy was in Florida fighting these Africans and Native Americans. Let me say that again. In 1859, at the e on the eve of the US Civil War, more than two thirds of the United States Army and Navy was in Florida fighting these people. Some of these sisters and brothers refused to sign the treaties and said, we will never lay down our weapons as long as a single African remains in chain. And so they engaged in a migration themselves that led them out of Florida through Arkansas and Texas and Oklahoma. And some of them ended up in Mexico where they kept, they kept fit, they trained around the beginning of the civil war. This is according to a story that a great scholar told me a militia of about 500 white folks from Texas went to Mexico to get those Seminoles. They were told that there were black people in Mexico with guns. And so this group of white folks were determined to go down and punish them and take them back into slavery. A great leader of the Seminoles at that time, a black man named John Horse, got out of his bed and organized his troops. And according to the story, killed 499 of those folks and sent one back with a message to Texas and there's some bad black people down here and we don't play, don't come back. So there are the descendants of the Seminoles even in Mexico now. So you have all of these different chapters of Africans in the Americas that for the most part, we, we don't know about. And that's inspiring to me. Malcolm X used to say, cotton picking don't move me. 
But when you talk about the African who fought, that's moving, that's inspirational, and that's what our people need to hear. So, so again, just 150 years. So this, the beginning, I guess, this, the end of the Civil War is kind of the end of the the um the, the fight against the, the um, Civil War. Yeah, the Civil War is very pivotal, obviously, in history for various reasons. There are other chapters. For example, in 1850, this is going in the other direction. You have 1850, 1851. The passage of the Fugitive Slave Act, which said that even if you were in the northern part of the United States, you could still be returned to slavery. And so a lot of Africans at that time went to Canada and founded black cities and towns up there. And, and I've been to the remains of several of those settlements. At the beginning of the Civil War, a lot of the brothers who were in those settlements in Canada returned back to the United States and fought in the Union Army. And then at the end of the war, a lot of them went back to the United States, all the rest of them, to find their families. So these are so many different chapters in history. And to me, these are just things that we need to know about because it gives us hope and inspiration. What did somebody tell me once? What you do for yourself depends on what you think of yourself. What you think of yourself depends on what you know of yourself. And what you know of yourself depends on what you have been told. So if you are told 24-7, my brother, that you ain't nothing, you never had a history, you'll act that out. But you know what I know. If you are told you come from royalty and you came from people who always resisted injustice, you will act that out. 